We've had a fair amount of software talks these last couple of days. I'm going to do something completely different and talk very much about the depths of hardware. So I hope I don't lose you completely. I'll try to go somewhat slow. You might be wondering where you know me at uh, from. I've had people tell me they use the slide. I figured I'm going to use it myself now. This is me. Um, I'm from the TU Munich, and we developed a RISC-V chip with some very, very wonderful tightly coupled post-quantum accelerators. And because we wanted to, we put some hardware Trojans in there. A lot of you are going to be thinking, hey, you made a chip with RISC-V. Why did you ruin it? Why would you do something like that? Why would you ruin a perfectly good chip and put changes in there? And there's a good reason for that. That's because I'm not a RISC-V engineer. I do reverse engineering, and I come from a security background. So. Um, what we actually wanted to do was figure out how would other people go ahead and put hardware Trojans into a RISC-V design, and how would we actually go ahead and find that. I know you're all interested in what we did. I'll talk about this very quickly, and then I'll get back to the other stuff I want to talk about, because I know everyone's always interested. So um, we have a risc core here. I think it's called Differently now, and it used to be from Pulp. I know it's somewhere else now. And we put four hardware Trojans in there. One of them is in the hardware loop. One of them is actually in the tightly coupled post-quantum accelerator, so that's the one you can see right up there where it says PQ, it's an NTT transform, and we changed some stuff in there. We have something that leaks a secret key via side channel, and we have a very standard uh, DOS that just basically kills the chip if, it's, if the um, trigger is started. And you can see some figures here about how detectable these hardware Trojans are, um, how they're triggered, how they're, you know, how big they are. And one of the fun things we actually did here is that we did some hardware software co-design, so we actually um, also changed up the compiler, so the attack can be that the hardware is changed and the compiler is changed, and that makes them even more difficult to detect. And if I showed you this picture on the right and said, where are the hardware Trojans? I mean, now you know because I put some circles there, but probably there's a good chance if you get this chip back, you have no idea. So you designed this chip, it's perfect, it's the chip you wanted, you send off to your foundry and it comes back, and you think it does exactly what it's supposed to do. Um, so our job is to figure out where are the hardware Trojans, um, and that's what we're actually currently doing. But I want to first go into how this actually works. So when we do, when we talk about full hardware reverse engineering, I know software reverse engineering, everyone kind of knows what they do. With hardware, it becomes more difficult. So what we actually have is we have our foundry. We get our chip, and then it becomes interesting. We have to depackage that chip. We have to grind it down every single layer. So we're talking maybe seven to ten different metal layers. We have to image that chip. We're talking hundred to a couple of thousand pictures per layer. Those have to be stitched together. We have to do a 2D alignment, a 3D alignment, and we're talking big, expensive machinery here. So this is millions of dollars, euros, whatever currency you want that is spent on this, and it takes time. Then we have to do interconnect, uh, interconnect identification. This looks something like this, so you figure out where are the wires between the transistors and how do they fit together, and you have to do this over several layers. You have to do gate identification, so you're really trying to figure out what gates are in there, how do they work, you have to look into the technology and then put them all together. And eventually, you get to a netlist. And that's where the fun part starts. So this first part here, that takes weeks, months, maybe longer, but we can do it in order to figure out if the hardware Trojan is in there, and that's what we're doing at the moment. Um, I don't want to talk too much more about that, though, because we've had talks on, the, on all the stuff before, and we'll talk about this maybe in a year's time. What I do want to talk about is open source uh, I see, and reverse engineering, and maybe some of the issues there. And I have to make a disclaimer, because I talk at a lot of EDA, EDA conferences, and they always say, okay, should we not use open source then? I love open source. We need open source. It is there to stay, absolutely. I don't need to tell you that. And this slide is fairly old, which you can tell by the sort of older projects on the side. Uh, I should probably update at some point, but I guess you guys know um, the hardware projects that are out there that are open source. Um, we love that it's transparent, we love that it's verifiable, we love that it's customization, but we love that it's low cost, and we love that it's available for us. So even with reverse engineers, we tend to have companies not be too happy if we ask them for chips to reverse engineer. They tend to not like that. So we could actually use this and make our own, and that's fantastic, because otherwise we wouldn't be able to research in that area very well. Um, obviously, coming from a security point of view, especially this idea of verifiability is extremely important. I'll get back to that a little bit later. On the other hand, I want to talk about reverse engineering. Why would we do that, right? It seems like a lot of effort for something that, you know, maybe we could do pre-silicon. Um, and we do it, as I've said, to identify hardware Trojans. So we're really trying to figure out, is there something in our chip that we didn't want there to be? It can also be done for things like product um, or production. So trying to figure out what the foundry decided to make a few more million copies of your chip and sell them under their own name or IP infringement. Um, I think. In an open source scenario, we don't really care about the last two. It's open IP, so 
we're not going to find any patent violations probably. What we do care about is hardware trojans because they become much simpler to insert. On the other hand, um, we're not obviously always the good guys in security. If you do something, usually you also sort of help the other side. So we've got to be careful there. Um, so reverse engineering is actually also used to figure out where am I going to place that hardware trojan, right? We, we figure out how to insert it. Without knowing the functionality, it's very difficult to figure out the right area. Um, we can also look into IP advancement, and we can also identify weaknesses for maybe subsequent hardware attacks. So really figuring out where the widgets I might want to attack in a fault attack, how would I side channel attack this? Again, in an open source scenario, probably we don't care so much about the IP advancements. The only thing that might be of interest is the way you synthesize, the way you optimize. But I mean, the RTL you can download from GitHub or GitLab, so not so important. And the thing that does become interesting is how does the attacker actually use this in order to insert our hardware trojans? And that's what we want to understand. Um, I'm very quickly going to show this slide because I'm sure that most of you know how chip design is done. We have some open source hardware design that we maybe buy from a couple of vendors. In this case, we get it for free, which is fantastic. Um, we have our in-house design team that does some integration of this. We do some RTL netlists that eventually sort of fall out. Uh, we do some verification, usually quite a lot of verification. Uh, some synthesis, we have uh, a gate level netlist, we have a physical synthesis, we eventually get our GDS2 layout that gets verified and it goes to the foundry and then eventually we get our chip and we have sort of our life cycle management of that chip. And I want to kind of look at this um, from a point of view of where would hardware trojans actually be put into here, right? Where is our supply chain problem happening? And the first place that we have um, is that it can come in from the IP that you buy or you get with open source. This is not so much a problem. We can verify it. So I think the, uh, the chance of getting hardware children through open source IP is very, very small. It could also happen that it comes in through your own design team. So maybe in integration, they, either you have someone who doesn't like you so much, or it's a bug. Lots of malicious stuff tends to be just a bug. So it doesn't always have to be someone going, I'm going to kill this chip. No, maybe they just program badly. The thing we carry, uh, care about most is this idea of the foundry. So this is the part that generally we don't control. It's not in a secure environment. So this is the thing that we get scared of the most. And depending on where, um, how you manufacture, it could also be, for example, in the, in the layout verification that you have someone in there able to change it. And what this guy's wondering, you know, I get GDS2 data, where do I insert it? So that's always the question that we ask there. So again, back to the slide I just showed before, reverse engineer process for the foundry, they don't have to do all this big, expensive, long-taking stuff. They get the GDS2 data from you, and they say, that's wonderful because I don't need an SEM. I don't need to ground down the layers. I've got everything there. I extract the netlist. I get the functionality. I know exactly where to insert. And in the best case, I know, hey, look, that's a RISC-V core. I have 20 pre-made Trojans just for that, so I'm just going to quickly identify where the parts are, where I want to go in there, and then insert. And uh, you are not going to notice the extra two days they take to do this because nowadays you don't get your chips back within like the, the standard four weeks. Um, we waited on hours, I think, for eight months. So who knows what they were doing, right? Um, so this is what the reality looks like at the moment. So you might be wondering, what can I do? Well, you can reverse engineer it after you get it back. When we do that, um, we have this big, long process. What does it look like from the foundry? They get the GDS2, they get the netlist, and where do they go from there? They want to understand what's the functionality, and for that, we generally have two different steps we do. The first thing we do is that we partition. So let's say you're sitting in front of 7 million gates. They're somehow connected, and you don't know where to start. The first thing you would do is say, OK, these couple of gates, these 10,000 up here, they form one functional submodule. These somehow belong together, we think. Down here, we have another 50,000. They kind of also maybe belong together. And you can think of it like, I'm sure you've all seen this picture on the left-hand side, figuring out where these boxes are, what boxes exist, where are they, and what gates belong to them. It's really only putting together gates. And the second thing we do is then we identify. So we put some labels on these boxes. We figure out these 10,000 gates that belong together. Yeah, they're probably a cryptographic accelerator, right? Maybe they're RISC-V core. We don't know. But that's what we're trying to figure out. So these are the two steps that we do. And I'll give you a quick overview of how that's done, because that's some questions I usually get asked. Um, when we petition, we can look at the data uh, path. So we really go from the inputs, and we go through and say, OK, data is flowing from here to here to here to here. And we can cut out pieces. And we can say, look, there's 32 bits going in here, 32 bits coming out here. Between that, probably something is being done that belongs together. Maybe it's a multiplier. Then you have two 32-bit words going in. Um, I call this sharp. It's very exact. We can really cut out very exact portions. And we can then work with those. It's very much like a, you can think of it as a divide and conquer 
kind of thing. So we keep dividing and conquering until we've understood what that little part do, and then we put it back together. Um, the second thing we do is a little bit more fuzzy, um, and it's called structural or graph analysis. And this right here is actually a RISC-V core. I'm guessing you've never seen it like this before. Um, I think it looks very pretty like this. Um, and what we actually see is about 250,000 gates. Um, each little dot you can see there is a single gate. Each connection is a wire. And I've highlighted some stuff here. And you can see, when you visualize it, you can see stuff that belongs together. And from that, we can also use that to partition. Um, the second thing we have to do, we have to identify. And when we identify stuff, we usually compare it against something known, a golden model. And of course, in open source design, we have that golden model. We just downloaded it from Git, so it's right there. Um, we can do it functionally, so that's formal verification based. We can really say we have our unknown thing, our known thing, we do formal verification. Do they do functionally the same thing? That's great until you have errors in there, so you're missing a single gate, some inverter is missing, and all of a sudden your formal verification says, no, it's not the same thing. Yeah, it happens, and it happens quite often here. So this is something we really only do when we've got perfect partitions. Um, what we can also do is we can, again, look at the data path, um, and we can see how does the data flow, and we compare that, right? Um, we also do FSM identification like this in control logic, so there's a lot of graph woo and stuff like that we do to get um, uh, this kind of stuff. And the final thing is we can also do the structural-based verification, and you can see here on the right-hand side, these are about 400 different designs, which I basically um, sort of layouted or graphed in a different way. So this is not layouting like in a chip, but in a graph-based view. And you can see things that are similar here. And these are all different designs, but you can see even visually that some of them obviously belong to the same group and probably similar. So you can see, uh, for example, right at the bottom down here, there's a couple that have these little dots. And even then, if, if I ask you the same, yeah, they're probably pretty close and they just tend to be different types of the same kind of module, for example, multipliers. And um, that's how we basically go about trying to figure out what this chaos of netless or of gates in the netless actually does, trying to identify functionality in there. Um, I'm going to give you an example. So we did a, a CVA6 core, which was called Ariana back then. And uh, this is what it looks like. Again, this is about 100,000 gates. And even then, I guess you haven't seen it like this. Uh, you, can, you can see some stuff just so you feel a bit more comfortable. I highlighted some main parts. In red, we've got the multiplier. Multipliers always look like this, by the way. Um, we've got the execution stage, Alu, right at the top in green. Uh, we've got some register files, um, the issue stage and whatever. I removed some stuff, so this is not the complete core, but you, know, you get the idea of what it basically looks like. And um, we wanted to see what happens if you know, one team synthesizes it one way and the other team does something completely different. Is it still the same? Is it comparable? And so I went ahead and I used complete open source toolchain. I use Yosis and Qflow and open source cell library. And we compared it to someone who does it very professionally. So we have a company that we work with who does professional chip layouting and design. And we said, well, how does it look like for you guys? We download the same RTL files, but let's have a look. And this is actually what we got. And you can see here, there is a fair amount of similarities. Um, I did highlight what we get out of our partitioning. And even there, we see that it's very, very similar. So even visually, without using any machine learning or anything else, we can say this is very similar. And um, there is actually a huge difference between these two files. Uh, one of them is about 20,000 gates more than the other. So one has, I think, 40,000 gates, one has 60,000 gates. Even then, we can say form follows function. Yeah? Structural differences show functional differences. And structural similarities show functional similarities. Um, we also did some countermeasures, so I think we've had a poster on logic locking. The idea is that we insert key gates, and if you don't have the right key put into the key gates, the functionality is wrong. So maybe you have a multiplier, it has 10 key gates. If you don't have the right key, it doesn't multiply, it does something completely different. And um, we actually did this with 10 and 50% key gates. In this case, they're randomly distributed, but it means that in the end, we have 10,000 gates more or 50,000 gates more. And I'll show you the picture, so this is our original. This is 10%. This is 50%, and these are the compared. I think everyone here can see that it's still the same thing. If I was asked, you know, what is this thing on the right-hand side, because the foundry has it, and they would like to insert a Trojan, and it's locked and thus secure, yeah, I would look at my implementation and say, yeah, it's probably, you know, the CVA6, pretty sure, visually. And that's me looking at it, five minutes of work. So. Logic locking is very often broken when we have an oracle, and in an open source use case, obviously, we very often do have the oracle. We can download it. Um, I like tables, so I always do a table like commercial versus open source. Um, partitioning for commercial is difficult. We don't know what we're expecting. Is there going to be five submodules in there? Is it going to be 100? 
in the open source use case, we know. We know the risk V has these modules. We know when we synthesize them, they're going to be this big, you know, and we can even test our methods. So we can even say, I'm going to test method X and see how well it works on my sort of implementation, and then it'll probably do pretty okay on the one that I've got in my foundry. The same thing works with matching, so this idea of identification. Um, in a commercial kind of view, we don't know. It could be anything in there. We don't, we don't have anywhere to go. We really sort of, you know, go in there very blind. In an open source use case, in the best case, we can say, yeah, well, we know if we do this thing, the uh, multiplier of the execution state is always going to be at the top left. That's very easy to do. Um, and so we even have, you know, unknown matching or very easy matching. What can we identify? Um, in a commercial use case, when we have golden models, they tend to be stuff that we have everywhere. So we have um, standard designs, we have adders, multipliers, interfaces, you know, these, these standard things that you get in your standard IP libraries. Um, in the open source, well, we just downloaded everything. We have it right there. We have every single functional submodule there in RTL description. We can even compare the entire design. So we have a complete coverage. Um, which brings me to the next point. In a commercial design, we never really reverse engineer everything. It becomes very, very difficult because there is so much customized stuff in there. In an open source design, if it's completely open source and the same thing that downloaded, yeah, we get everything. If you have decided maybe you would like some cryptographic accelerators or you have your own IP, um, that's going to pop up. That's going to be highlighted for us. So anything you add to it will be much, much easier for us to find. Anything that is not standard is not going to help. In fact, you're going to really jeopardize that because we will see. We will know that's not part of what they had on Git. You obviously thought it was important to change that, so let's have a look. So lots of people say, okay, can we mix open source and commercial? Yeah, go ahead, but we're going to look. We're going to want to know what the commercial parts are. Um, errors occur in a commercial use case very often. Reverse engineering is difficult. It's uh, frustrating. We have errors. Same thing happens in the open source use case. We didn't get better reverse engineers, but we know where these errors occur and why we have something to compare against. So we can verify and remedy any errors that do occur. So that's a huge help for us. So I get asked very often, what can I do? Um, so I always say, well, you know, trust your IP. And that's something I think we can do in this community. This is the fantastic thing about open source. We don't have to be worried about getting black box designs. We can trust, we can even verify ourselves. Trust your foundry. Um, big red question mark, yeah. That's something you have to decide. Is, is your foundry someone you trust or not? So I think that's, that's, that's a different discussion. Um, testing and hardware torsion detection before and after silicon. So I think in the before use case, uh, open source really helps here. In a commercial, um, in a commercial environment, it becomes very, very difficult to very well formally verify your, uh, your IP. And that's to test for Trojans that might be inserted here. Um, after manufacturing, open source doesn't help. I mean, obviously, for us, it becomes more easy to reverse engineer as well. But if we were to say, OK, we get back our chip, we would have to run through the whole entire SEM, deep packaging, imaging, stitching to properly do that. So there are other ways to you know, detect hardware Trojans. You can do side channel stuff and stuff like that. So that's also a possibility if you think you know, I'd like to go so the easier way, of course, during the complete reverse engineering process, we'll give you 100% surety that it really is the chip that you designed, but it's more expensive. Um, you can use countermeasures, um, but please be aware in an open source use case, you cannot ever assume that we don't have an Oracle. So even if you did something about, you know, um, that we don't have access to any testing structures or anything, the Oracle is going to be out there. It's sitting in a GitLab page. So anything you use as a countermeasure, it must be secure against that. And the two things we actually found that make it a little bit more difficult for us is customization. So anything you change, that's not something I can download. And anything that makes partitioning more difficult. These things, they're not things that are going to protect you forever. But if you know your foundry, if you told them, look, uh, for security, I'm going to give you this design and I want it in four weeks. So you don't have time to put anything in there. These are the things that are going to make it from like one day to insert a hardware Trojan to maybe a week, two weeks. So maybe they just stretch that time a little bit longer and make it more difficult to do. I do have to say at this point, you don't always need to know what the design does in order to put in hardware Trojans. There are obviously hardware Trojans we can put in that um, just kill the chip or something like that. That's always possible. But the more complex and the more hard to detect they become, the better it is to understand exactly where in your design you're putting what. And that's why it becomes so important. So I have some key takeaways. Um, open source IC design, it simplifies reverse engineering, which can be great. But it also means hardware Trojan insertion becomes so much more easy and become the thing from maybe a couple of months or weeks of planning to really something I can have prepared in my back pocket. Hey, look, open Titan design, I've got one for that. You know, put it right in there, a day or two of work. Um, we have solutions, they exist. 
um, they don't have much overhead. We even use them already, but people aren't really aware, and we must work more in that direction. And I know you guys, there's a lot of software stuff here, so if you're interested, if you say, look, I might look into the field of hardware, feel free to come talk to me. If not, just be aware that these problems exist, you know? Like, if you do security and software, um, and then, you know, don't care about your supply chain security, yeah, it's maybe not the correct trade-off. Um, and I think one of the great, great things that I always say is that, you know, open source design, RISC-V design, provides a really unique opportunity to really have provable security against hardware trojans, especially in this, in this first part, you know, up to, to um, fabrication. And I think that's, that's fantastic because that's something that we've really been worried about for many, many years now. And um, it's only become possible in the last, you know, couple of years since it's really become normal to have RISC-V designs. And I think that's really, really fantastic. So thank you to everyone here who allows me to do my research because you guys decided let's do some RISC-V stuff and open source IC design. Otherwise, I couldn't do my research. Um, so, honestly, big thanks, and if you have any questions, feel free to talk to me at some point. Thank you very much.